And uh, this is a peoplesworld.org Google Hangout. Good evening, everyone. This, my name is Joe Sims, and this is a peoplesworld.org Google Air Hangout. Uh, welcome. Uh, with us this evening is John Bactell, the recently elected uh, national chairman of the uh, Communist Party USA. John was elected at the party's 30th convention in Chicago, Illinois, last June. Welcome, John. Great to, great to have you this evening. Hi, Joe, and uh, hi to all our listeners tonight. John, um, uh, congratulations, uh, let me say, uh, first. Uh, everyone uh, that I've talked to is very happy uh, about your election and and uh, the uh, entire leadership team. Um, tell us, how does it feel to be elected national chairman of the Communist Party? Uh, big responsibility, right? How's it well, going? Yeah, indeed it is. Um, I uh, feel very uh, happy and encouraged by the national convention, the 30th national convention that we held. Uh, it was, by and large, a very united convention around our uh, policy, our strategic policy, and we elected a wonderful new le collective leadership, uh, which I'm a part of, and uh, feel very um, optimistic and uh, very uh, excited, you know, to uh, be trying to unfold the policies of the uh, convention, and I must say also I want to extend my appreciation and thanks to uh, Sam Webb and the previous leadership for the tremendous le uh, leadership that they've given the party over the years. Yes, indeed. Uh, they they did a good job, uh, but now uh, uh, you're the uh, uh, chairman of the party, and uh, and uh, ultimately the buck stops with uh, with you, right? I mean, you got um, uh, to to grow the party. You you got to raise uh, a lot of money. Uh, you You've got to help the uh, party figure out its uh, strategy and uh, tactics. Uh, is there anything that keeps you up at night? Oh, there's plenty of things that keep me up at night, uh, including if I overeat. Uh, but <laughs> definitely, I, uh, you know, the, the biggest nightmare that I have, of course, uh, going forward is the 2014 elections and the thought that possibly... Um, the Republican right wing might take over the U.S. Senate, um, whereby that would be a real disaster for the country and, of course, uh, would put a total block on uh, any, kind of, any kind of progress going forward as if uh, it wasn't bad enough having the Tea Party control the House of Representatives. Uh, so, yeah, that, those are one of, that's one of the things that really keeps me awake at night and... Uh, Hopefully, we'll have a good outcome of the elections. Well, how does it look? You are hoping for a good outcome, but if the uh, election uh, were held tomorrow, what's your guess? Uh, would uh, the uh, Democrats hold the Senate, uh, hold the House, or would the uh, uh, GOP kick booty? Well, I think it's it's very close, and it's all going to depend on voter turnout in a number of key states. Um, and I think what's important about uh, the 2014 elections is that it's not the same as the 20, uh, 2010 elections when we saw the Tea Party surge, which began in August and carried almost all the way on through the elections. Uh, we're not seeing that this year. In fact, uh, there's a great deal of dissatisfaction uh, with the Republican Party. Uh, but, you know, this is uh, a year that also incumbents tend to, to lose. Um, and people are dissatisfied with the gridlock, you know, in Washington. Um, and they're taking it out on whoever is there. So, um, but the main thing is I think we have to make sure that everybody understands clearly what's at stake in these elections. Uh, I think the uh, 
that secret meeting that uh, Mitch McConnell spoke to, um, in which he announced that he's going to, uh, you know, his policy is going to be one of total obstruction uh, in the Senate, and he's going to basically hold the president hostage. Well, if that's not a wake-up call, uh, then I don't know what is. So I think we have to really work hard between now and Election Day to get the vote out in all these key states. Well, you may not be seeing a surge in uh, Tea Party uh, support, but you are seeing a surge in uh, big money. I mean, you got that Citizens United decision, and the corporations are pouring tons of mega bucks uh, into the uh, electoral cycle. Is is that going to be the decisive factor? Uh, well, it certainly is going to be a big challenge for us to to deal with. There's no doubt that there's probably more money coming into the elections now than maybe ever, uh, and including the Koch, the the, the Koch uh, brothers' money and, and and that kind of money uh, that's coming into a lot of these key races. Um, but you know, on the other hand, you know, there's a very uh, well-organized movement out there led by the labor movement, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, trade unionists and others who are hitting the ground every every weekend uh, in labor walks and uh, hitting the phone banks uh, just about every night uh, calling into key districts and key states. So they may have the money, but we have a lot of troops on our side. And um, I feel that once the word gets out and the message gets out uh, to working class communities all across the country about what's at stake. I feel people will vote in the right way. Now you live in Chicago, John, uh, and uh, is your team out, out there working on the uh, elections? Have you guys been doing phone banking? Oh yes, we have. And uh, one of the uh, this is a key battleground state here in Illinois. Uh, there's a very close race. Uh, with our governor, uh, incumbent Democratic governor, uh, who's being challenged by a hedge fund billionaire uh, who has no experience in politics, but is a uh, has experience making a lot of money and is putting it to good use, trying to buy himself a, a governorship. Uh, we don't want another Scott Walker here in Illinois. Uh, so the labor movement's fully mobilized here. We're part of that mobilization. Been hitting the phone banks. Some of our members have been out on labor walks. Um, and one of the key issues here is raising the minimum wage, uh, which is also, I think, a key issue all across the country. Um, and the uh, current governor, uh, Democratic governor, is very much in support of raising the minimum wage. And actually, the, this uh, Republican challenger is for reducing the state minimum wage. So that shows you the difference right there. Sounds like a loser to me. <laughs> Well, you know, John, we uh, this is an election a, a cycle, and uh, there are uh, big issues uh, at stake, uh, both uh, at home and abroad, uh, including the issue of uh, war and peace. And uh, as you know, our president gave a speech last night, uh, uh, I'm sorry, last week, where he uh, announced to the American people and to the to the world actually that uh, they want to start a open up another front in the bombing campaign uh, and uh, against this Islamic State, this ISIS or ISIL, or whatever you want to call them. Uh, they want to extend it from Iraq now into uh, Syria. Is that uh, an electoral tactic? Is is uh, Obama playing to the crowd in order to gain support for the Democrats in the uh, Senate or in, in the House? Is that, is that what's going on? Well, I think that's probably a factor, uh, especially in some of the key uh, you know, districts where uh, there are some conservative Democrats that are running. And, uh, you know, oftentimes uh, that's a policy that uh, is initiated before election times to try to kind of, you know, get people uh, galvanized. Uh, but, you know, this is a policy that we really disagree with. This is, uh, uh, there's not going to be any good outcome with a, uh, a military 
um, policy here in this region. It, it's our thinking that it's just going to help inflame uh, the situation there. Um, and the whole history that we've experienced over the past uh, 13 years, we ought to really study that. Uh, uh, both the intervention and the aggression in Afghanistan and also Iraq. Um, it hasn't put an end to terrorism. In fact, it's only deepened, you know, the problems of sectarian violence and uh, a lot of these terrorist organizations, you know, just are offshoots as a result of, of the policy that's been unfolded. Um, we're for a political solution uh, to dealing with uh, ISIS, terrorist uh, organization and threat, uh, bringing all the key players in that region together uh, to uh, work out a solution, including Iran, which has been iced by the uh, administration in these negotiations and in this coalition, um, and finding a way to cut off the funding, both the funding and also the uh, soldiers that are going into the battlefield. Um, and thirdly, to demilitarize that whole region. This is one of the most militarized regions in the world. And every, every uh, group imaginable is armed to the gills with uh, weapons. And that's really no way to solve anything. And so we're for uh, demilitarizing that whole region and finding a political solution um, to, the, to this uh, conflict. Well, maybe we should start by um, ending uh, the U.S. law of, uh, of uh, arms there. But let me pursue this for a moment. I mean, the president did a 180-degree turn. I mean, uh, he gave a speech a year ago, um, I, I believe at West Point, um, where he called for congressional approval of uh, acts of war and and uh, and uh, a limitation of the exercise of executive authority in that regard. And then um, last week he cited um, the same legal mechanisms, the same use of presidential authority that Bush did. I mean, what does that say about um, the nature of the presidency uh, or about the pressures that are on him? I mean, I know that, you know, he's not, um, he's been a reluctant, uh, 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 seemingly reluctant participant in this whole uh, thing uh, over the course of the last period, but um, the guy just flip-flopped. Uh, What's up with that, in your opinion? Well, you know, the uh, foreign policy establishment in this country is deeply embedded in governmental policy, and it, uh, in some respects, it uh, policies continue on uh, uh, from administration to administration. Um, and uh, this is, I think, a case where by uh, that foreign policy establishment in particularly the more hawkish elements of it are kind of asserting themselves. Um, and I would say that uh, it also um, uh, is a reflection of the fact that the peace movement in this country is not strong enough to be able to uh, assert itself and be able to um, influence the policy. Now, it's, a, it's different than last fall, as you were mentioning, the the whole crisis with Syria and the threat to bomb the chemical weapons, uh, uh, you know, factories and whatnot in Syria. And the American people were opposed to that. And there were vigils and demonstrations and rallies and marches all across the country. And that really, that, that pu public opinion, I think, was decisive in blocking that, um, you know, that, that, that military option from unfolding. Well, we're not we're not seeing that quite yet. You know, the the latest polls show that unfortunately the American people are are uh, backing this course of policy, although not very strongly. I mean, the majority of them don't really have much confidence in 
uh, that, you know, that this policy is going to be effective. So it's kind of soft support. So to the extent that the peace movement uh, can get it, that we can get out there and, and help to mobilize and change public opinion, we might be able to stop this uh, military option from being carried out. But, uh, you know, again, this is, uh, we're seeing a long-term commitment here. This is almost like the endless war against terrorism. Well, certainly we, we would hope that uh, the people and the peace movement and the democratic movement generally will, will get busy and, uh, and, and try to change it because certainly uh, uh, the policy so far has uh, seemed to uh, backfire and it seems like we're just digging ourselves into a deeper and deeper hole. For those of you who just joined us, uh, my name is Joe Sims. Uh, I'm a co-editor of peoplesworld.org, and you're watching our peoplesworld.org hangout with John Bechtel. John is the uh, recently elected national chairman of the Communist Party uh, USA. Um, you can uh, find out uh, more uh, about the party by uh, visiting its website at uh, www cpusa.org. Uh, um, you can also read articles by uh, John and uh, uh, many others about some of these issues that we've been dealing with, uh, the war on terror, uh, the elections, uh, low-wage worker campaign at peoplesworld.org. John, let's turn the uh, conversation a little bit more domestically and uh, and talk about the issue of climate change, uh, uh, which uh, most people recognize as an existential threat, threat to our existence uh, as a planet. I hear you're coming to New York this weekend, and we'll be marching uh, on Sunday uh, in the climate change uh, demonstrations. Are you going to carry the party's banner? Oh, yes. I'm really looking forward to joining with... Uh, I don't know, this could be uh, half a million others, uh, other Americans uh, uh, marching uh, to raise this issue very sharply and we're going to have a contingent, um, a party uh, ICL contingent and looking for, for, very much forward to marching with all of our comrades from around the country. Now, uh, you recently wrote an article uh, on this uh, issue and uh, on the issue of climate change, and you seem to think that we're at a unique moment when broad forces uh, from the grassroots uh, up to the corporate boardrooms on Wall Street, uh, or at least some of those boardrooms are coming together. There's a growing recognition that unless we do something, um, uh, the moment will come when it will be too late. Do you think the march uh, and events like this uh, are going to be enough to make a difference in Congress? Well, they they will certainly help. Um, uh, you know, I think these are the kind of events that really uh, put this issue much more squarely in the public debate and especially if you have a half million people or so marching in, in New York. Um, and it's, I think, a reflection of the fact that uh, the climate consciousness, so to speak, has been growing exponentially, and people are re reacting to, uh, really, to their everyday lives, you know, to extreme weather events. Uh, we have half the countries in a, in a horrible drought, uh, particularly California. Um, and uh, we have hurricanes and uh, heavy rainfall, flooding, um, and so people are are responding and reacting uh, to their their you know realities. Uh, uh, so you have that on the one hand, and then on the other hand, you have the emergence now of a section of Wall Street who uh, is concerned not only for humanity but. Uh, mainly for the future of capitalism because they see that uh, this climate crisis is having and is going to have a very severe impact on the ability of capitalism to function. Uh, and they outlined a whole series of, of things, including its impact on uh, 
on uh, agriculture, on workers, um, on our urban areas, um, and uh, you know it's just going to make uh, life much more difficult. And and you know not only just not only here, but also of course globally. And they're concerned too about their own foreign investments and the stability of capitalism worldwide. Uh, so this this uh, section of Wall Street is calling for a low carbon or carbon free economy. People like Al Gore and Robert Rubin and others, um, you know, who who believe in what they call sustainable capitalism. It's not what we believe in, obviously, um, but nevertheless, there are some points of unity. For example, on a carbon tax of some sort, anything that will bring down the um, emissions, greenhouse gas emissions. And what this does is it puts this section of Wall Street in direct conflict, I think, with the fossil fuel industry, the, the oil and, and coal uh, industries, the ones that are emitting all these greenhouse gas uh, gases at this time. And it, 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 it raises the possibility of a much broader, of growing this movement, you know, much, much more broadly and isolating this a fossil fuel industry, which is the support base of the extreme right in this country. So it may not happen in this election, but certainly down the road, we can see that with this kind of broad coalition isolating the uh, fossil fuel industry, potentially, we have a, a, the possibility of undercutting the extreme right, the Tea Party and so on in Congress and other elected offices. So that's a really important development as far as I'm concerned. So um maybe not this election but maybe in 2016 yeah it's possible i mean because you have in the in the especially in the in the house of representatives you have it dominated by the tea party faction which is which are made up mo a lot of uh their members are climate deniers they're irrational they 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 don't uh they can't be persuaded by the science you know uh, they, they dispute it, they reject it. So the only way to really change is to defeat them and get them out of the way. And I, I think that uh, it's certainly possible going forward that the climate issue is going to grow uh, as far as an election issue, not only in this election, but going forward. It will well, become uh, more important. Let me, let me ask you then, uh, is there a good green candidate that uh, the Communist Party is supporting for 2016? <laughs> Well, we're not, uh, it's a little early, we're not endorsing any candidates, obviously. Our main aim is to build this broad people's movement against the extreme right. And uh, that's our main aim, but in so doing, we're also uh, about electing much more progressive uh, candidates, left candidates, socialist-minded candidates where we can, although I don't think that's probably going to happen on a presidential level, um, but certainly uh, locally. Um, much more progressive uh, and independent candidates, uh, and to help in the in that process to build uh, structures of political independence um, all across the board in its many varieties and shapes and forms, so that one day down the road, hopefully, we'll have the basis for forming a, a third party, a, a labor-led people's third party in this country. Well. Um let me ask you then, um, so you, you don't want to, I think it's too early, you don't want to venture a guess about the presidential race, but will, will the Communist Party be running uh, any candidates uh, on a local level or statewide, uh, uh, city council, school board uh, in the coming period? Well, you know, there are uh, communists who have run and have been elected in the recent period to mainly local office. Uh, we're very proud of them. We had a network of uh, elected officials at our last convention uh, just in June. Um, and we want more. We're trying to encourage many more of our members to run for public office, no matter what the level, whether it be for uh, you know st uh, city council or school board or uh, local school council or planning bodies, it doesn't matter. We want 
we want to encourage our members and others, other left and socialists, to, to run. Um, so we want to be part of that, but we see these as coalition campaigns. We're not out here by ourselves. Uh, we're part of coalitions, and we don't see uh, really candidates winning without broad coalitions behind them, capable of, of moving and mobilizing the vote. Uh, and we have to earn our, our, our wings, so to speak. We have to earn our leadership. We have to earn the right to run in these campaigns. And, and so to the extent that our, our members emerge as leaders in the grassroots movement, they'll also emerge as candidates. Now, you mentioned a, uh, a coalition, and um, I, I read your closing remarks at the National Convention, and, and uh, you uh, uh, called for um, some kind of left unity coalitions uh, with other left groups. Um, but we have a situation in our country uh, where most people who are socialist-minded or who are left uh, uh, are not in organizations. How do you see uh, bridging the gap between um, the organized forms of the left and, and these broader left coalitions that you talked about in your closing remarks? Well, that's a good question. That's a huge challenge, I think, for, for us, for the party and for other socialist and left organizations because uh, one of the things that's happened over the last uh, few years is that we've seen the emergence of actually a pretty sizable um, section of public opinion that has a very, very favorable attitude towards socialism, actually thinks socialism is a better system than capitalism. Um, something like on the order of maybe 60 million Americans I mean, almost half of all young people have that, that point of view. So this is a substantial um, section of the population that we need to engage with. Uh, uh, the party has been working um, in dialogue with a number of other left organizations, uh, but certainly it's not broad enough. And uh, we're not in position right now to certainly reach this whole uh, mass of, of 60 million and so it's it's really going to be a challenge how to speak to uh, this uh, you know section how to um, engage with it uh, how to get our ideas out and certainly through the social media and and uh, the internet and whatnot that's a really powerful way but also we have to figure out how to do it on the grassroots level as well. So this is a huge, this is a huge challenge for not only us but for the left and progressive movement in this country. Let me uh, uh, talk to you a little bit about the uh, Communist Party it, uh, itself. Now you were just elected chairman in June, and um, uh, you have conventions uh, once every four four years. Uh, where would you like to see the party? Um, in four years. I mean, um, can you talk a little bit about your goals uh, um, uh, and objectives uh, for, 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 for the next period? Well, I think the biggest challenge for us is that we're not big enough. We're just simply not big enough. And um, I think that uh, for us is to really grow the party into a sizable uh, organization uh, that's relevant on the grassroots level um, and you know we have a lot of respect uh, among uh, sections of the trade union movement activists in the environmental and people's movement um, our publication the people's world is read uh, by activists across the country um, but the you know the the fact is that we're just not big enough uh, our, our ideas are not getting out uh, as far as they need to uh, and we need to we need to strengthen our work on the grassroots level to be act much more active in the labor movement and in the community organizations and and uh, at the grassroots so I see those as as the really big challenges along with this other you know big challenge of how to reach you know this 
huge number of people that have very, very favorable attitude towards socialism and who we agree with, and they would agree with us, you know, uh, if they're aware of our program. So I think that's a huge challenge and one that we're going to work very hard to try to, to meet. Let's say all of these objectives are met and, um, and then some. And uh, let's say, uh, just let your imagination run wild for a second. And, and uh, we're at a new moment and uh, the unexpected, you know, could happen. And, and um, you know, Obama was elected. Uh, nobody thought that, that was going to happen. So uh, well, you don't want to skip stages. And this is just a flight of fantasy. Don't get me wrong. But use your imagination. And let's say that everything came together and... Um, uh, an electoral coalition was formed and you, John Bechtel, were selected as the presidential nominee and, and uh, lo and behold, boom, you got elected. What would your first 100 days look like? Well, that's guaranteed to give me some sleepless nights <laughs> right there. Uh, well, first of all, I think that this... Um, Obviously, this coalition hopefully would have the power to elect not only a president but a Congress uh, because the worst thing would be for us to have a president but uh, for the right wing or, or uh, opposition forces to be able to obstruct everything uh, that we wanted to do. Uh, but it would have to be a very broad people's coalition, obviously, that uh, uh, was elected. And it would, it would be elected, I think, uh, with a mandate, uh, first of all, uh, to address the uh, economic uh, situation this country faces, the jobless crisis uh, that's been going on, uh, you know, since the recession, you know, we've had a jobless recovery. Uh, I think there's something like 28 million Americans who are still unemployed or who are not working full time. Uh, so we want to uh, kind of take a page from the book, I guess you'd say, of the Roosevelt administration and initiate a public works uh, program that would put millions of people to work, um, rebuilding the infrastructure of the country, but in a way that is modern and uh, is along sustainable lines. In other words, we'll, we would not only create jobs, but also transform the economy in the process, the way that we uh, produce energy and, 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 and our conservation. So, for example, putting millions to work uh, retrofitting buildings and homes with uh, modern insulation to conserve energy um, or replacing the gas pipelines you know across the in, in, in cities and towns all across the nation that are leaking along with water water pipes uh, that are leaking uh, you know all, all kinds of uh, water and gas and so on um, and that we would you know uh, build uh, or, or retrofit homes and buildings with solar panels and uh, you know build wind farms and, and that kind of thing there's there's enough to do um, and then in addition to that put millions of people to work as teachers you know we've been cutting back on our schools uh, for so long uh, we need to reinvest um, in our school systems modernize the buildings but also reduce class sizes and and hire millions of teachers to, um, you know, bolster up uh, pu our public education system in the country. Same thing with our health care system. There's a need for uh, expanding uh, health care access to millions of Americans. So, there, so we can really put the country to work uh, if we go in that direction, and that's what we would launch. But you have a crisis uh, on the border um, with Mexico. Um, and you get all of these children there, and and in general, there's a there's an immigration crisis. Uh, how would your how would your um, uh, administration uh, uh, deal with uh, that? This is Joe Sims. Uh, you are uh, watching a uh, PeoplesWorld.org hangout with John Bactel, the um, national chairman of the Communist Party. Um, John was elected at the 
party's uh, 30th convention in, uh, in uh, Chicago last summer. Um, and we asked John if uh, he would take a flight of fantasy with us and imagine what he would do if um, by some um, circumstance, uh, some stroke of enormous political luck ended up president of these United States and there's a crisis at the border, uh, what would your administration do? Well, this yeah, this is a humanitarian crisis, uh, uh, crisis um, that uh, you know we have to deal with by not uh, you know uh, jailing uh, children and jailing uh, immigrants who are coming to this country, but by providing uh, the kind of uh, ha safe haven for many of them who are escaping, uh, you know. Uh, Violence and uh, drugs, drug gangs, and and cartels, and 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 that kind of thing. So uh, we would we would I think work very very quickly to, um, you know, again institute a humanitarian policy, close down these jails, uh, find homes for uh, the these children who are coming across the border, and at the same time, um, you know, we also have to. Uh, change our, immig our immigration policy completely. We need to, to institute a path to citizenship for the 11 million uh, undocumented wor uh, workers and their families who are living in the shadows in the United States, extend full equal rights to, uh, to everyone, including uh, political rights, uh, right to uh, you know, uh, join uh, unions and, and so on. And so in this way, um, you know, we, we want to extend democracy, extend democracy and extend humanitarianism rather than the current uh, policy which the extreme right is trying to push of just a callousness of, of uh, endangering the lives of these children, of trying to expel uh, you know, immigrant workers, undocumented immigrant workers and their families. Well, um, and that's a travesty. Um, and uh, and you're, you're right to con condemn it. But let me ask you, John, uh, what about the revolution? I mean, you, 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 you wrote an article recently uh, uh, dealing with the issues of reform and revolution. And um, uh, you're the president of the United States. I mean, um, um, how would... Um, you talked about Bill of Rights uh, Socialism. Um, how would that fit into the uh, picture? Um, okay, maybe it wouldn't be in your first 100 days, but uh, what would be the process leading to your party's uh, goal of, of bringing about uh, social, social revolution in, in the United States? How do you see it? Well, we, we firmly believe that the path to socialism in the United States is uh, through democracy and the democratic path, and that is that, uh, you know, it's going to be a, a struggle to expand democracy, both political and economic rights, for the working class. Um, I, fr I firmly believe that um, we can utilize uh, the election, the electoral arena of struggle, to uh, win socialism. It's going to be a very, as I see it and as we see it, you know, a very broad coalition of socialist-oriented organizations and forces that will work together. We're not going to be alone, uh, but there will be a whole socialist coalition uh, that can be elected. Um, it's going to go through many stages, and uh, through those stages, um, you know, they'll... Uh, the, Assuming that uh, this coalition is, in, uh, you know, elected to positions of, of uh, authority, um, we'll be able to uh, progressively curb the power uh, of the of Wall Street and the capitalist class, uh, expand the public sector, uh, you know, restrict uh, capital, um, and in so and in so doing, also expand, as I said, the democratic rights 
of the people, help to strengthen the labor movement, uh, the right to vote, and so on. Um, so we, we see this as a very long-term, prolonged process, um, and the ability to make reforms and to make deep radical reforms uh, all depends on the social and class balance of forces. To the extent that the working class and its allies are united and conscious and, ha are, and have a, are united around a, a radical set of uh, radical program, um, that will be that will determine how how far we're able to go with these uh, radical reforms and including, uh, you know, uh, uh, developing a, a socialist uh, type policies. I imagine it's going to be pretty contested. All the way, all the way. Well, John, um, you know, we have a lot of uh, questions um, from our um, listening audience. Uh, those of you who just joined us, uh, my name is Joe Sims. I'm a co-editor of peoplesworld.org. We're talking this evening with John Bechtel, the uh, chairman of the uh, Communist Party. Um, and uh, we just asked him about the um, socialist vision of the uh, Communist Party and how uh, it sees bringing about real change uh, uh, in our country. Uh, before we uh, turn to uh, ask a couple of these questions, John, you, you were talking about the uh, future. I wonder if you could look back for a moment um, and uh, give us a sense of, uh, in your view, looking at the party's history, uh, just very briefly, what would be its two uh, biggest accomplishments? Well, that's, that's pretty hard uh, because the party's played such an important role in the history of this country going back 95 years. Um, but just two, two things that come to mind. Um, one is, uh, you know, I think is our current anti-ultra-right strategy. Um, and we developed that uh, when uh, Ronald Reagan was elected president and the extreme right took over the Republican Party. And we were among the first organizations to issue a warning about the danger of the extreme right. And we were right then, we're right now. And uh, even though it's been over a 30-year struggle, uh, I think this policy has has been correct all these years, and in fact, uh, many other organizations uh, have come to see that, and there's a very broad movement against the extreme right. But again, we were one of the very first organizations to sound that alarm. Okay. Uh, uh, and then, secondly, I think you know during the obviously during the 1930s, when the party was probably its biggest, uh, you know, we led a whole uh, helped to lead a whole movement to organize the. Uh, trade union movement in this country, the mass production industries, um, and of course the unemployment compensation uh, and the expansion of, of those kinds of rights. But at the center of it was uh, the call that the party put out for black-white unity. And of course today, black, brown, white, multiracial unity. Uh, we were among the pioneers in in calling for for that kind of unity and. Uh, understood the, the power of a united working class then and now. Okay, and um, those are those are big things, I would say. And the party's two biggest mistakes. <laughs> well, you know, if you're in the struggle, you you make mistakes. Uh, but as William Z. Foster always said, if you keep your eye on the working class, you'll make mistakes, but you'll never make the big mistakes. And so I think we probably have avoided most of the big mistakes. Uh, but, you know, I think most people recognize that probably our biggest mistake was our, during right after the Second World War when uh, some in the leadership of the party really mistook the wartime alliance uh, as a permanent condition and, and saw the need for or, or advocated class partnership. Um, but that quickly fell apart and... Um, of course, they called for dissolution of the party, and it happened for a couple of years, and that really weakened the party, especially, um, you know, in the face of the on onset of the Cold War. Um, 
so I think that was that was a major mistake, uh, which uh, we paid dearly for. Um, the other thing is I think is more of a historical, uh, and that is you know our party was born as many other communist parties were born uh, during the time of the October Revolution, uh, and the during that time the the Soviet Party really had a huge impact on the culture of the world communist movement, including our party. Uh, and it's been a long process uh, to try to find our own way. Um, and I think that that's the big challenge we have, is how to fully Americanize the Communist Party. We've made a lot of headway over the, the la you know the years, but we really have a lot more to do, how to root ourselves much more in the in the revolutionary democratic tradition of our country, all of the, the symbols and, and so on of our country uh, and its revolutionary heritage. Well, speaking of uh, Americanizing the party, uh, the Democrats and Republicans, they have mascots that are in the form of animals. I mean, everybody knows that the Republicans uh, are, uh, even though they act like jackasses, uh, uh, have an elephant. And the Democrats have a donkey. What would be your proposal to the next convention of the Communist Party about an animal mascot? <laughs> I'll leave that to the convention. <laughs> I'll leave that to the collective wisdom. I mean, would, would, it, would it be an Irish setter, like, um, you know, that story Big Red? Or would it be a Cardinal, the bird, you know? Uh, cardinal, uh, or uh, would it be a uh, brown hog, uh, you know, uh, no, no, my favorite is the Cardinal. I, 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 I was an advocate of the dog for a long time because I'm a dog lover, but I like the Cardinal more because it can fly, you know, the dog can run, but Cardinal can fly, and I think that our movement needs to take flight. Let's uh, take some questions from the audience. I got one from um, the, um, I believe this one is from the uh, Bronx, and uh, I think that uh, you used to live up there. Uh, why did you join the Communist Party? Well, you know, I'm a, I guess you could say a, um, product of the 1960s, um, and I was shaped by that era, uh, the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement, and uh, my parents were not party members, but they were active in both those movements, and so that really shaped my thinking. Um, I grew up, you know, with politics around the table and those kinds of values, so it wasn't really a big stretch for me to, uh, when I found that there was an organization that had the vision of equality and uh, democracy. Uh, I became, I was really excited about it, so I joined the party back in 1977 um, and have been uh, active ever since. Okay, here's another question uh, from Roger. He asks, how can we make Marxism slash communism seem cool again? Uh, we have a, a heck of an image problem to con, uh, to uh, contend with. How would you coolify, uh, <laughs> if you will, the uh, Communist Party, John? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I'd be actually interested in hearing what what uh, Roger has to say about that. Um, but I, I think that yeah, we have to. That's one of the quests that we're on. Certainly, is is how to how to have a modern image uh, for a communist party and utilizing all of the modern uh, means of communication um, to get our ideas across, uh, with, including not only uh, video and audio, uh, music and culture. All those means, I think, uh, we have to give the, the image of a cutting edge organization um, that's modern, uh, that speaks the the language of today uh, that's, uh, you know, uses the symbols and, uh, as I said, language uh, that that people use. Uh, and too often times I think, um, you know, uh, 
many on the left uh, use symbols from previous eras um, and it kind of gives the idea of a organization that's or a movement that's uh, you know captive of the past uh, we don't want to be that way we want to be a modern organization modern movement takes up modern you know today's issues like the climate crisis and and whatnot uh, and utilizes the most um, up-to-date forms you know for conveying our message okay um, thanks John uh, let's see we're still looking at the questions uh, once again uh, you're watching the uh, people's world org uh, interview uh, with John Bactel uh, John is the national chairman of the Communist Party you can find out more about John and the uh, Communist Party by going to its website uh, at cpusa.org. Uh, please check out um, peoplesworld.org um, and also both of uh, the peoplesworld.org pages uh, and the party's pages on uh, Facebook. Um, um, Duncan wants to know what is our best case scenario for getting our candidates to the uh, voting booths? Um, as you indicated, John, a uh, uh, big uh, question uh, this November will be turnout. Um, will the party be picking people up and helping them get to the voting booth? Yes, we're going to be act. We are active now. You know, in in the the uh, voter uh, outreach, you know, with the uh, labor movement, with uh, uh, the labor walks, canvassing, with the uh, phone banking, uh, trying to reach not only uh, working families, labor households, but also uh, in general, you know, people that are uh, have been identified as uh, supporters of uh, labor's agenda. So we're really active now, you know, doing that kind of outreach. And as we get closer, you know, there'll be a lot more that everybody can do in terms of helping to get the vote out, especially on election day. Um, so I, I want to encourage all of our members and those who are listening in uh, to plug in, you know, to the activities that are happening uh, in your area. You know, go on down to the uh, Central Labor Council and man, uh, staff the phone banks, uh, go out on the labor walks, um, you know, help to distribute uh, literature. Uh, and the main thing for us, I think, is also trying to help people understand what's at stake in this election. Um, and that's what we're trying to do through our, our people's world and through the other literature that we get out to help them understand, help people understand what it would mean if the Republican right wing took over the United States Senate and control both the Senate and the House. And Mitch McConnell has already said what they're going to do. They're going to obstruct. They're going to uh, hold the president hostage. They're going to demand cuts to different things if he wants to get something passed. Uh, so it's going to be more gridlock, more obstruction. And that's something that would be a, a, would be a horrible thing to happen for our country. And we have to do everything we can to block that and stop it. Agreed. Uh, Michelle. Uh, wants to know, John, what have been um, what has been one of your best and most uplifting political moments in the party? Um, um, and what have been the worst? <laughs> and she also wants to know why should an activist uh, in the union, a church, or community organization? join the party. I mean, Michelle asks, what have you gotten out of it? Mm -hmm. it. That's, that's quite a quite a question. Um, well, just in terms of uh, my time in the party, I would have to say that probably being part of the uh, campaign, uh, the uh, broad movement, that elected uh, uh, Barack Obama's president in 2008 was probably one of the most exhilarating uh, moments that I've been part of uh, politically for a whole number of reasons, including 
fact that you know here we elected the first African American president in in the in the in history of the country, um, and you know I think the uh, uh, of course the wor one of the worst moments that I've ever experienced was when when George Bush uh, stole the election in in 2000. We had basically what we called an American coup. Uh, at that time, that was one of the low points uh, for me. Um, but thankfully, you know, the American people recovered, and eight years later, uh, you know, elected uh, uh, you know, someone who, who was moving in the opposite direction. Uh, well, I think one of the, um, you know, uh, most important things about the party is our, in terms of what we convey, our, our, our are the morals and ethics that we go by. You know, we believe in community and solidarity, in uh, brotherhood and sisterhood, uh, in caring for uh, each other, um, and that's that's those are real working class values. And uh, but we also see obviously the need for not only practicing that on a day to day basis, but um, you know, finding a way to organize society around those those ideas and in order to do that you have to get active politically um, and so for that reason you know it's important to join the Communist Party and to and to work with like-minded people uh, who have the same kind of, of desire and the same kind of values okay um, we have another question um, John, are you still there? I'm here. Okay, we have another question. Uh, would the um, um, Communist Party consider term limits um, in order to uh, eliminate... Joe, you're cutting out. I I can't hear what you said. But if you if you said term limits for the Communist Party, well, you know one of the I think really important innovations that we um, experienced in our last convention uh, was a very public uh, leadership transition which took place, um, and it was part of it was also an effort to you know, break with this uh, culture that uh, had been had been uh, uh, kind of prevalent in in the uh, uh, communist movement globally. You know, where oftentimes uh, communist leaders would serve for for many years. Um, and we, what we did was we organized a an orderly leadership transition uh, with the idea in mind that we want to constantly find ways to bring younger, newer uh, members forward into leadership and that uh, we needed to have a reasonable amount of, uh, an expectation of a reasonable uh, term, you know, for those leaders to, to serve. So without maybe putting limits on it, certainly we're for, um, you know, orderly and regular transition of leadership, bringing forward new people, new ideas, and uh, fresh ideas and so on. I think we've lost, lost Joe, lost everybody here. Well, we were talking earlier about maybe this is a do-it-yourself hangout. I can't see the questions. 
I know there's some questions here, but on my um, screen here, I can't see any of the questions. Okay, well, um, maybe I can just say a, a word or two also about political developments uh, here in Chicago, since that may be of interest to our listeners, uh, since this is where I live. Um, you know, we're, we're really dealing with two elections here in Chicago, and, and one is the November elections, uh, and the second is uh, there are some municipal elections that uh, will be occurring in February, but really the campaigning has already begun, and, and uh, the potential uh, for uh, huge changes in the electoral landscape and the political landscape in Chicago is there, much like we saw in New York and Seattle, uh, if a movement is able to come together. Uh, so we have, as everybody knows, we have a... Uh, Wall Street uh, corporate uh, Democratic mayor in Rahm Emanuel. Uh, it looks like uh, he's going to be challenged by the president of the Chicago Teachers Union, uh, Karen Lewis. Um, and at the same time, there's all kinds of grassroots candidates that are emerging to run for alderman, um, which is an amazing thing. Uh, so we're having we have this kind of current of political independence. Uh, sections of the labor movement, um, activists in the grassroots who are coming together uh, in a coalition that could elect uh, a teacher as mayor uh, and teachers and other workers uh, into the city council. So we're really excited about this. Okay, so there's a there's a question here that says, how can we ally ourselves or advocate for Democrats when they have proven time and again to be pro-war, anti-labor, pro-upward redistribution of wealth, pro-free trade, and as ruthlessly capitalist as the other wing of the business party, Republicans? Um, well, you know, that's, uh, that's a really good question, and... Um, the, uh, the, the, 